Shimon, please. Minister. Thanks very much. Um, the HMO um, Act 2016 came into operation in April 2019. My department commenced um, a review of the implementation of the HMO licensing scheme in 2020. The operation of the licensing for HMOs is led by Belfast City Council on behalf of all councils. And my department provides support and assistance to councils in the development and the licensing scheme and has provided detailed guidance for local government in the exercise of their regulatory functions. We have also provided a statutory code of practice for landlords to manage their properties to the, requirements, uh, to the required standards. I propose that the review is to look at the impact of the regulatory scheme on councils in terms of resource guidance and legislation, with a view to identifying any changes necessary to ensure the legislation achieves its policy intent. We have directly sought views from councils and landlords. The Department does not have information on tenants who are living in HMO properties, therefore sought the views of those tenants through tenant advocacy groups. The online survey um, on NI Direct website has been open since December 2020 for tenants or anyone with an interest in the regulation of HMOs to provide their views on the implementation of the licensing scheme. The Department will analyse the responses of the survey and take forward um, work on any changes required to ensure the scheme functions as intended. Paula Bradshaw, supplementary. Um, thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Happy International Women's Day. Um, obviously, we both represent the Holy Land area of South Belfast, Minister, and you will know that there are ongoing problems there escalating as we get closer to St Patrick's Day. So, um, First of all, in relation to the consultation that closed on Friday, are you going to try to meet with the actual residents in the Holy Land area, either through Zoom or some socially distanced meeting, to hear firsthand from them a more qualitative response to the consultation about how their lives are impacted, and will you join with me in calling for people to stay away from the Holy Land on St Patrick's Day? Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks very much to the member, and I suppose the question is timely because of the week um, that we are going to be approaching. And obviously, as I say, I mean the primary of this, um, I suppose, this consultation again was to look at how the scheme is running in terms of how it's functioning within Belfast City Council primarily, but how that impacts across all 11 councils. So it is very much to look at the resource, the guidance and the legislation itself. As I have said, um, it will also engage with residents and those who come forward, which will include, I'm assuming, the Holy Land residents as well. Obviously, I'm acutely aware as a local representative for the area and having served on Belfast City Council of the issues that have been going on. I mean, I know the previous um, MLA for the area, who's now the Speaker, had done a report on this some 10 years ago as well. We have obviously had the Buchanan report from Louise Buchanan also. Um, there has been the group that's been set up within Belfast City Council as well, looking at the issue. Um, so obviously, I want to continue to engage, yes, with residents who live there, with students and representatives, and also landlords, um, and also the statutory agencies in terms of the longer-term solution. I mean, we recognise that the HMO legislation in itself won't deal with the issue because the area is already over the capacity or the threshold that would be set if you were looking at HMOs freshly today. So we do need to look at what we can do to rebalance that community um, in terms of the needs of all of those who reside within it. Um, I would echo the call, and indeed I have done it um, as well, in terms of telling people we are still in the midst of a public health pandemic. I know the Health Minister has been out on this also, and people need to adhere to the, the guidance and the regulations. I am asking any person who thinks that they want to go to the Holy Lands next week not to do so, um, to use their common sense and to ensure that they stay away, not just for the peace of mind of residents and students who live there, but also for the wider public in terms of the pandemic that we're trying to deal with and for the, the health trust who are trying to reduce cases um, at the moment. Time so again, up. I would echo the calls for um, calm and for people not to go near the area. We call Karen Mullen. Karen Mullen. Karen Mullen. Karen Mullen. Karen Mullen. Karen Mullen. Minister, I thank you for your answer so far. I know that you are committed to improving protections for tenants in the private rented sector, and I have written to you in the Housing Executive in relation to unlicensed HMOs in Derry. Minister, what is your department's oversight role regarding the licensing of HMOs, and what is your department doing to address the unlicensed HMOs? 
Thanks very much for your question. I suppose my department has responsibility for the policy and legislation of HMOs. And obviously, um, HMOs in some ways meet the housing needs of singles, um, those in temporary employment and students, those on low incomes, and also migrant workers as well. And it's important they're considered as part of an overarching um, housing mix. Obviously, councils have been responsible for the implementation and the licensing of that from 2019, and that requires landlords to meet important quality and safety standards before a HMO is let. I would advise that obviously Belfast City Council, through the HMO unit that's been set up to cover all of the councils, if you do have concerns about specific addresses, that they should be raised with that unit as soon as possible, and uh, further action can be taken. Nicole Sinead McLaughlin. Question number two, please. Thanks very much. I suppose I want to ask, answer questions two and nine together as they refer to the revitalisation of the housing executive. And the plans of my colleague, previously Carl Nicollin, set out to members in November's statement on housing reflects a much needed revitalisation programme aimed at securing the long term future of our biggest social landlord, ensuring the maintenance and investment in our social homes. One of these measures, which I have been urgently pursuing, is exempting the housing executive from paying corporation tax, and I am happy to report that this exemption will now apply and will result in millions of pounds of additional investment in the housing executive homes. Whilst this is welcome news, the, cha the change alone uh, will not alleviate the investment challenges faced by the housing executive, which in 2018 was estimated in excess of £7 billion needed over the next 30 years. This level of investment is simply not affordable, particularly as one of the biggest constituents of the housing executive faces is its inability to borrow, and borrowing in its current form scores against the executive's block grant. Borrowing to maintain homes would be the cost of other capital uh, priorities, such as investing in hospitals and schools. Work has commenced to update the investment financial analysis, which now needs to reflect the recommendations following the Grenfell Tower fire and also carbon neutralisation. I have asked officials through co-design to consider and access options which will realise my vision for the housing executive, whereby we have a sustainable social landlord that can maintain and provide good quality and affordable social homes for those who need them. As Carl said, out, consideration of options will focus on those that promise to retain its valuable uh, Sorry, to retain what is valuable about the housing executive model, and indeed I have asked officials to ensure they exhaust all options uh, which limit change as far as possible. I intend to bring recommendations before the end of this mandate, which up. will include details on time scales and budgets for implementation. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for your comprehensive answer. Has the Minister and the Finance Minister uh, considered making a cost proposal to the Treasury? on a housing revenue account for the housing executive, enabling it to borrow? All options are being explored at the moment in terms of looking at that. As I said, I want to keep the good qualities off the housing executive as it is at the moment. If there's a way that the housing executive can borrow without any change, then I'm exploring that as the primary option. But we have to look at all options because the financial challenges the impact that this is having on the existing housing stock just can no longer be ignored, and therefore all of those options are being included at the, are being considered at the moment. Once that's done, then proposals will be brought forward for decision. Can we please bring the member Pat Catney on screen, please? Well, we have a glass from Colin. Uh, Minister, thank you. Pat Catney, the question so far, and uh, may also take this opportunity to wish all the women there. Uh, a great day for International Women's Day. Minister, what steps will the Minister take to ensure that any reclassification does not lead to insecure tenure, higher rents and less accountability for housing executive tenants, as we have seen with the transfer of public housing in Britain? Thank you. Well, obviously, as part of the British Irish Council meeting, we're looking at uh, practices of what has happened elsewhere across these islands. For me, the key is to ensure um, that we have a social housing landlord that is fit for purpose, that we have homes that are up to date, 
And obviously, we know that if we don't look at the investment challenges faced by the executive, it will lose over half of its stock um, over the next period of time. And therefore, that jeopardises um, the future in terms of social house building, and particularly with the biggest landlord going forward. In terms of looking at options going forward, I mean, I uh, have given a commitment previously that we want to co design options with tenants themselves. We want to make sure that they're involved, but also those who are on the housing waiting, waiting list, those who have been waiting years in order to find a social home to call their own. And we want to also to design those options with uh, the trade unions and also with the workers within the executive as well. Primarily, I want to look at options where the housing executive can borrow, as I've said earlier. We have also given a commitment um, to look at a sustainable rent trajectory for housing executive tenants, whilst also giving a commitment that they should remain some of the lowest uh, rents as they are across these islands at the moment. So I'm committing to look at all of that um, in terms of the overarching plan that I will be bringing forward to the executive within this mandate. Thank you, Mr. Cahill Boylan. Call Cahill Boylan. Okay, John Corleone, and um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to thank the Minister and welcome her commitment and determination to build better and, and newer homes for the people. But could I ask the Minister, will the removal of the historical debt on corporation tax enable the housing executive to begin to build much needed homes again? I suppose the removal of the historic debt and exempting the executive from paying corporation tax um, will only give a minor alleviation of the overarching investment challenge. Obviously, it is welcome um, the announcement in last week's budget. There is still a long way to go. And I suppose we have to look at this comprehensively in terms of a review of the housing executive rent, having, making sure that we have a long-term sustainability model going forward. So all of these things will be taken in the round. Just dealing with corporation tax um, in itself and the debt won't overcome the challenges that are there. The housing executive has to have the ability to borrow in terms of looking at future house bills, but then also retaining the existing and future stock that it will have. So work is ongoing to cost up those options, and again, they will be presented to the executive when the time is right. I call Andy Allen. Thank you, Minister, for her answers thus far. Minister, the revitalisation statement made mention of reclassifying the Housing Executive as either a mutual or a cooperative type body. Minister, are you able to point to a similar body in another jurisdiction which has the same vision as what you are creating for the Housing Executive? I suppose we are assessing all options at the moment. Primarily, I would like to do this with retaining its current classification, and we are obviously exploring all of those options at the moment. But I think everybody recognises that just standing still. I mean, there's other questions here um, within question time that look at the standards and the conditions in which residents are living in at the moment. And we clearly know what the investment challenge is when you look at um, almost seven billion pounds that is going to be needed. The money is clearly not there. I mean, that would nearly be my full budget over the next eight or nine years. I mean, that's the reality of the challenge that we're dealing with. So, obviously, looking at the classification, the big focus is trying to get the housing executive to borrow, that they can look at a long-term investment over many years and use that borrowing function to be able to do that. Uh, we want to look at other options. As I said, we are continually engaging across the islands to look at what options work well. I know the new chief executive coming into the housing executive obviously has extensive experience sitting on housing associations in England, but obviously also worked for um, a, home, a housing charity in the south of Ireland. So obviously we'll be engaging with them also. So all of this will be part of that process um, that we're going to be looking at over the coming months. They will be costed up in terms of looking at the pros and cons. And as I said, I want to remain committed to the good values of the housing executive, what it has been in its 50 uh, years of formation, and I want to make sure that we carry that on to the next 50 years going forward. But I want to make sure that we can retain the stock that we have and that we can build even more stock in the time ahead. Let's call Rachel Woods. Okay, thank you. I'll call Kelly Armstrong. Mr. Speaker, I will stand up for the next question. Sorry. Okay, I call Andy Allen. Mr. Speaker. Sorry. In 2019, the Housing Executive published a research report on cavity wall installation, 
The findings um, for the housing executive stock were based on a sample survey of 825 properties. The research found that 63 per cent of those properties had cavity wall um, installation um, installations that were non-compliant with modern industry standards. Although the housing executive's data on the construction of all the stock is not comprehensive, it estimates that if the 63 per cent um, is, is exacerbated, it would represent some 40,600 of the housing executive's cavity wall constructive properties. Um, so it is an issue at the moment, obviously, that we're looking at. Andy Allen, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as the Minister has pointed out, there is a significant problem uh, within the housing executive stock in relation to cavity wall insulation. Um, the recommendation did uh, point out that 63 per cent of the stock, as the Minister had mentioned. However, the housing executive had indicated that they do not intend to take this recommendation forward in their current financial circumstances. Has the situation with the corporation tax had any bearing on that, Minister? And also, can you advise, in respect of the 1 per cent of properties, how many of those there has been action taken? Well, obviously, we're looking at the action plan in terms of the cavity wall action plan. It's out for consultation at the moment. It's due back at the end of March. So we're going to be looking at all of these and the proposals contained within it. Part of this is obviously part of the wider revitalisation programme, looking at the funding, looking at the sustainability of the housing executive. And there are critical issues. I mean, in, in real life, this is what this means. The investment challenges that are, that are there mean that people are sitting in substandard homes. Um, they're not sitting above the standard that is required that if you were building a new property today, and that's not good enough. You know, we need to deal and overcome those challenges. So I will be looking at the action plan, the consultation, and listening to what tenants and what um, housing professionals are saying, um, and I will be considering that as part of that action plan at the end of March. Uh, we do want to look at this in terms of the longer term, set as against the financial plan around what can we do to make sure that the existing stock of over 80,000 homes under the housing executive's ownership, how do we make sure that we bring those up to a, a standard um, for today, but also looking forward in terms of the retrofitting um, issues that are going to need to be looked at by way of fuel poverty and the carbon emissions targets. This will be part of that revitalisation and there will be costings done as part of that and will be presented to the executive before the end of this mandate to be taken forward. Call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you very much, Minister. Uh, Minister, I'm glad to hear you using the term retrofitting, um, as some of us have been working on environmental options moving forward. Could I ask then the cavity wall review that's happening at the moment, given the fact that many people in the building industry say that actually cavity wall insulation currently used, that's the polystyrene polystyrene balls is actually causing so much of the dump. Is it not time to set that aside and to start looking at, at our retrofitting from now? The retrofitting issue is being looked at. Obviously, we're at the start of that. Um, there's been a cross-departmental working group, obviously established, um, just to look at our, I suppose, our, the green commitments that we have made, and obviously looking at uh, the target by 2050 in terms of having carbon neutral options coming forward. We are looking at an assessment of properties um, in the time ahead. There obviously is a huge issue around dampness um, and around cavity wall installation and just how these homes were constructed to begin with. So there are issues that we need to look at the building standards and particularly for new builds going forward. But then all of this in terms of being costed up, prioritising what it is we need to move on, we're considering that at the moment as part of the wider revitalisation agenda. Those will be costed up in the time ahead, um, and then we will publish a plan going forward. Obviously, the action plan around the cavity wall insulation, as I say, I mean, I'll be reviewing that once the consultation is finished, and then proposals for implementation of that as well. Um, some of that may be superseded by this longer-term work that we're going to be looking at, um, but obviously we're not at a point of readiness in terms of giving an update as to where we are. We're just really at the start um, of that process. Oh, Philip McGuigan. Uh, Minister, just given the answers to the questions today and previous work that you've been involved in, uh, I mean, it's clear that improving housing quality in private and public uh, sectors for tenants is, is something that you're clearly committed to. You have alluded to the uh, cavity wall insulation plan and, and you've given a time frame for March. Can I just ask, over and above the, 
the consultation period, what progress has been made, and if there are implementation timeframes agreed? Yes, yeah, I suppose on the 22nd of December um, last year, the Housing Executive issued the draft cavity wall insulation action plan um, for public and industry consultation. This set out proposals for address and research finding and recommendations. Um, response to that consultee will be due on the 31st of March of this year, um, and then we intend to publish the final action plan later in the year. So once we have a more definitive date, once we've uh, obviously assessed the consultation responses, I'll be coming back and updating members in due course. Call Robin Newton. I thank the Minister for her answers so far, and I have to say I welcome uh, the work that the Minister has outlined in terms of energy conservation within public sector homes uh, lo long, long overdue. Can I ask the Minister, though, you have uh, frequently referred to the modern standard or the standard for public sector homes in energy conservation. Could you be quite specific, Minister, and tell us what that standard is, and how does that standard compare with the standard set for private sector homes? So I suppose what I refer to is building regulation standards need updated. Um, it's an issue that has been uh, long running at the moment. So in terms of looking at new bills going forward to ensure that we are future proofing, we need to be updating those regulations as soon as possible, taking into account um, in terms of looking at the issues um, around climate change, around fuel poverty, around the need to retrofit, what needs to be retrofitted, but how we future proof those homes going forward. So it's those regulations I refer to that need to be updated, um, need to be engaged upon, um, and I would be hopeful that we start to look at that as a matter of urgency, um, because if we are going to reach the targets that we want to reach by 2050, um, then the regulations need to be updated um, as soon as possible. And moving on to the next question, Rachel Woods. Five. Thank you. My department is leading on the development of the Executive's anti-poverty strategy using a co-design approach. Consultation on the emerging strategy is planned for later this year, and it's anticipated that, subject to executive agreement, the new strategy will be published this December. It was recently announced that the 2016-19 child poverty strategy was extended until May 2022. The purpose of this strategy is to ensure that the government works collectively to tackle the issues faced by children and families, and the reason it was an extended to allow this poverty work um, to continue through a co-design approach. The extension, um, obviously, work progresses on the anti-poverty strategy. There are a number of opportunities for children and young people to be engaged with the development process. And I would also note um, that my department has invested, obviously, in the region of over $304 million uh, pounds in a range of support programmes and projects responding to the hardships faced as part of the pandemic. I suppose I mean, the um, expert panel on the anti-poverty strategy was obviously reported. It was launched uh, on Friday. We now move in. The co-design groups have been established. They obviously have access to that report now, and they're going to start now the important work on co-design and the actual strategy, obviously taking into account what the expert panel has said but then also taking into account maybe other experiences and particularly engaging children and young people, children rights advocates, um, and also the cross-departmental work. So the role with education and health is going to be critical over the next couple of months, and then for a draft strategy then to go out for consultation um, later in the year. Rachel Wood, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. The official figures are showing that one in five children here live in absolute poverty, and worryingly, there's been an upward trend in child poverty levels since 2018, which is upset to continue as a result of the pandemic. And in answer to previous written questions, the Minister had indicated that child poverty strategy has never been allocated funding specifically. Can I ask why this is the case and whether the Minister is minded to support fully funded delivery models or mechanisms to accompany the development of the next strategy, including cross-departmental budgets, given the Children's Services Cooperation Act would surely facilitate this? Well, I think one of the issues coming forward, obviously we are developing the anti-poverty strategy and also looking at children's poverty. One of the early considerations for the co-design group is whether those two strategies merge into one. Um, and there's some consideration. I know the expert panel looked at this issue as well. We're obviously engaging the Children's Commissioner and others 
So that will be one of the first areas around um, does that become one strategy. The next phase, obviously, is part of having the co-design group working with the sector, in which children and young people's, um, I suppose, professionals and advocates are part of that co-design group, will be engaging with children and young people themselves. The other important strand is obviously the cross-departmental work. So that's where there has to be representation from all of the government departments, recognising that this is a cross-cutting issue. It has to be people then who can make decisions, who can align budgets in order to meet the needs. And it is about costing up the proposals that are going to be contained within the, the anti-poverty and children's poverty strategy going forward. Mm -hmm. So I would like to see proposals when they're presented to the executive that they will be costed, that they will be time bound, and then it will be for the executive when they receive this at the end of next year to look at that as part of the budget setting process going into 2022. I call Mark Dorgan. Thank the Minister for her answers till now. Child poverty figures, as Ms Woods has alluded to, have not improved here in five years, and there are now 122,000 children living in relative poverty. Will the Minister mitigate against the two-child tax credit rule and benefit cap to ease the immense pressure on families with children, and if so, when? This is a crucial issue which has obviously been raised as well in the expert panel when I engaged the Human Rights Commission as part of their work looking at future mitigations that was also looked at. Um, of course, I would be supportive of bringing forward proposals um, that end that along with other mitigations. As you will know, the issue will be the budget and the block grant. Um, we have been trying to get into a cycle to have multi-annual budgets that you don't come to a cliff edge each and every year around grants programmes right across the board. That has had not happened this year, unfortunately. The member will also know that we have got a flat budget this year, which in real terms means a cut. And that, that impacts on the executive as a whole. So whether that's children and young people through education, through health, through the Department of Communities. So I will be bringing forward proposals in terms of looking at future mitigations, um, of which uh, this will be one of the issues that will be considered in the time ahead. I will be bringing forward costings, and then it will be down to the executive as a whole then to look at the financing around that. And I do also think that there needs to be this needs to be raised within the British government. I mean, we have said that we should be building back better, we should be building back social, that when you look at this pandemic, it impacts on low-income families, on women and on children the most. Um, and so therefore, are the budgets or the block grant in which we're given, is that going to reflect it? It hasn't. There's been no reflection of that. We've been given an increase around COVID monies, but that's in your cash, and you know that we can't then build that into our revenue base. So there's a job of work of convincing the British government um, of the value of looking at this within the block grant. And of course, I will be bringing cost of proposals to that effect. And I would encourage all parties within this executive to work with me and across the executive to ensure that we can implement that in the time ahead. Robbie Butler, very briefly, please. Uh, Mr. Speaker, can the Minister advise what collaboration she has had with the Minister for Education uh, on efforts to address child poverty? Well, as I say, um, we're at the early stages, obviously, of developing the child poverty and anti-poverty strategy. The expert panel was established. Their report was launched um, last week before it went public. I've obviously communicated that with the Minister, with all executive ministers, including the Minister of Education. We have been working more closely in terms of COVID, looking at issues of child poverty and obviously looking at the free schools meal issue and other issues as well. The cross-departmental working group includes representatives from the Department of Education and obviously there will be a big role of work for ministers and also officials to look at these plans in detail, to work with the co-design group, to actually do things differently in government and I think that's going to be the key thing, that what we have been doing up until now Things need to change. We need to be more joined up. We need to break down the silos. And there's a real opportunity to now do this with these strategies, working with communities and with young people out on the ground in the time ahead. I will be convening a meeting with the executive ministers in April. It's due to take place in terms of looking at these issues, um, giving an update on the expert panel reports, and then importantly, making sure that I have executive buy-in to the strategies as we move forward 
before the final documents are presented to them in December. So it's an ongoing engagement at the moment, and I think it will be important that all executive ministers, this isn't just an issue for me in the Department of Communities, I've given a commitment that I will start to devise and put the work into the strategies. Government across the board in all departments they now need to be working more collectively together and aligning our budgets to what these strategies uh, will be recommending. So we'll be doing that in the time ahead. Time's up for a list of questions, and we move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Alex Easton. Speaker, Minister, there are more than 6,039 people waiting for PIP appeals. How are you planning to deal with this unacceptable backlog in PIP appeals? Yeah, there's been um, a huge issue, and obviously uh, the member will understand. The reason has been obviously the public health pandemic, where there was suspension of face-to-face assessments in terms of looking at this. Obviously, we've been working with the appeals service in terms of looking at all of these appeals and issues. Um, and you are right, there is a backlog at the moment that has been created. We have tried to look at telephone interviews to take place. We're also looking at virtually uh, doing that through Zoom. I think the important thing is um, to recognise is that the appeal has to suit the appealant in terms of the nature and the type of appeal, particularly when you're looking at issues such as PIP, when it's looking at someone's uh, either physical disability or looking at their mental health and well-being. When we have done some of the, like a satisfaction survey, looking at this issue, over 60% of those appealants are saying that they want a face-to-face um, assessment um, and appeal to take place. The difficulty at the moment is we're still within COVID regulations, um, which doesn't allow for that. The appeal service themselves have obviously suspended face-to-face. That has been extended to the first week in April, taking into account the current health regulations. So we're keeping it under review at the moment, whilst we're still trying to look at other options and present more options for people, as I say, to look at online, uh, Zoom, to look at telephone uh, appeals. If people are looking face to face, then we'll have to look at how we can accommodate that once the, the restrictions begin to ease. And again, we'll be working with the appeal service to see if we can create a timeline as to how quickly we can reduce that waiting list as much as possible. So again, I can't give you all of the answers now until we know where the regulations are being reviewed on the 16th. Um, but as we move forward, I'm hopeful that it can supply more information to the committee and to the chamber in the time ahead. Alex Easton, supplementary. Thank the Minister for answers so far. Um, could the Minister give me a guarantee for those people who finally get their appeals and, and could have been waiting for well over a year that those payments that possibly are awarded to them are backdated from the date that they've actually applied or from the date that they've actually had their PIP taken off them? The awards are looked at in terms of backdated from the date of appeal, yes, so that is one of the issues that are considered. Obviously, our focus now is to make sure that we can get appeals looked at as soon as possible, um, and we'll be working through that with the appeals service and also with the independent advice sector who are supporting many of these individuals. I call Robin Newton. Speaker, and uh, thank the Minister for her answers so far. Would the Minister agree with me that the allocation of $36.2 million for the development of the sub-regional stadiums for soccer is indeed a very positive move, not just for sporting reasons, but for mental and physical health reasons? Yes, I think definitely um, the sub-regional stadia um, will be doing a lot of good in terms of grassroots football, in terms of the impact that it's going to have on the ground. Obviously, I'm keen to see this progressed as soon as possible. We're obviously working through the advisory group, looking at the sub-regional stadia, working with the sporting uh, governing body um, and with those um, organisations that are involved. And I want to bring forward proposals in terms of taking that forward as soon as possible and getting that money that's been allocated out as quickly as we can. Supplementary, Robin Newton. Mr. Speaker, Minister, ten years ago the $36.2 million was allocated. There have been two consultative uh, uh, exercises on the appeal, on, on, on the programme. What possibly can be the problems that are not allowing you to allocate the money to the successful applicants? The first uh, report is ten years out of date, and when I come into office, the second report is four years out of date. 
Um, the last consultation that was done will be getting published um, as soon as possible. And I think when you read that consultation, you will see um, that how the previous scheme brought forward that not everybody is in agreement. I wanted to take a fresh look at that as the Minister responsible, and that is why I have engaged in this short review process. And my aim is to bring forward that scheme within this mandate to ensure that the money finally does reach those who need it. Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Professor Eileen Everson envisaged that the independent advice services were a vital part of the mitigations package aiming at protecting the most vulnerable from the harshest impacts of welfare reform. So can I ask the Minister to provide any further update on discussions she is having with the Department of Finance and the Executive in relation to securing the £1.5 million allocation for vital independent advice services to people? Yeah, no. Well, I see the value of the independent advice sector as someone who works as a community worker um, past. Um, I'm working with people who avail of the advice service, just even in the area that I live in. And obviously, I mean, as I said earlier, we have been given a flat budget. Um, it didn't include uh, the 1.5 million, but I have given a commitment um, that I value the role um, that the independent advice sector does. I acutely see um, the need to continue independent advice, particularly for those that are going through the welfare changes that we're facing, um, and that I will find that within the budget um, coming into the new financial year. Supplementary, Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank the Minister for her answer. Um, on the 16th of February, the Minister previously stated regarding the bedroom tax, I have draft legislation and regulations to close the loopholes to ensure that families, just over 220 of them, do not fall through them. I will soon bring these forward for executive approval to be introduced in the new financial year. So, can the Minister provide an update in relation to this legislation being brought forward to the Assembly? Yeah, the regulations or the changes that are needed um, are ready at the moment. I done a meeting on this with officials last week in terms of some that needs to just go through the committee and then obviously the legislative changes that need to be made. I will be making a further submission to the executive shortly um, in terms of bringing that forward before the end of this financial year. Paul well, Colin McGrath. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the Minister will, like all MLAs, have received significant correspondence in the past period uh, encouraging us all to move towards banning conversion therapy. Could we get an update from the Minister on the progress of that? Yeah, thanks very much for this. Um, and it's an important issue. I obviously met with a group of doctors just over a week ago, ago sorry, some of whom were involved in the Spotlight programme last September on this issue. I've also met with some political parties to give an update as well. The important thing when we were looking at this, obviously the executive agreed a new decade, new approach to the sexual orientation strategy. That draft strategy again, or sorry, the expert panel report on that strategy was published on Friday. Part of that, um, the issue of conversion therapy is one of the things. So firstly, I want to give a commitment that I want to bring forward legislation. I want to draft legislation which bans it. I think, though, when the expert panel were looking at this issue, rather than rushing in to bring forward legislation now, there is a need that we need to do an assessment of how widespread this practice is. We need to look at the levels and the different names that this practice is called, because even though Britain had made announcements over two years ago, we know that legislation was going through in the south of Ireland. Part of the way that they tripped up on their legislation was the assessment of how wide scale this issue was. We are going to be looking at that, uh, working with the co design group on the sexual orientation strategy to ensure that we have up to date data and information looking at this practice, because I don't want to leave any loophole in the legislation that this practice then could continue, and therefore the legislation would be meaningless. So I am going to be bringing that forward. At the meantime, I will be looking at drafting legislation at the same time, so as we're doing that assessment of need, um, that we're not waiting on that being completed before drafting legislation. So hopefully over the coming months, then, we'll start to have it more formulated. We'll establish how widespread this practice is. We'll be able to include that as part of the drafting of the legislation. And then by the end of this mandate, that we will have legislation there to go in front of the House. Supplementary, Colin McGlath. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank uh, the Minister for her response. This is uh, a harsh and cruel 
uh, practice, and it does seriously impact the mental health of members of our community. And as I say, I welcome the announcement of strategies and impending legislation, but sometimes the executive is good at announcing strategies and legislation, but not just so good on delivering them. And can I take this opportunity to encourage the Minister uh, to move as quickly as possible to deliver this, whilst at the same time undertaking all of the loopholes that she has mentioned. But we are the last place on these islands to deliver this, so there should be plenty of experience out there on what to do and get it right. Is that when you look at other jurisdictions and what they brought forward, it hasn't been good enough, and the expert panel has recognised that, that there have been huge gaps. And what they've been telling me as the Minister, I mean, I would bring this legislation in tomorrow and ban the practice if I could, but I have to listen to those who are impacted on this on a daily basis. And I agree with you in meeting with people both privately and openly on this issue over the last uh, couple of months. People have been completely affected by this, and it has completely changed their life their family dynamics as well. And obviously it is a, a cruel treatment that has to be banned and ended as soon as possible. But I have to make sure that we don't make the same mistakes as other jurisdictions, which has actually held up the implementation of the ban. And, and obviously you'll be aware of the campaign um, that has been done. The British government announced that they were going to ban it two years ago and nothing has been done for these exact reasons. So I want to make sure that I want to work with the community in assessing what the need and what the, the breadth of this problem is. But also, um, I'm not going to wait on that end, and I want to draft um, legislation as we're moving through that process to ensure that once that assessment is done, we can then move uh, with legislation. So I do give a commitment that I won't be waiting about. I want to do this as soon as possible. And indeed, if you want to sit down with me at any time, I'm more than willing to do that. Call Keith Archibald. Uh, I am um, like to congratulate the Minister on her success in ensuring the exemption of the housing executive from corporation tax. Um, can I, she detail how much additional funding will now be available for social and affordable housing as a result? Come yeah. Out yeah, if you give me one second, I have. I think over from over the last six years, there's been over 56 million that has been paid to the British Treasury by way of corporation tax duty. Um, and it's a huge amount, obviously, in that six-year period um, that could then begin into housing and the provision and, obviously, updating of the existing housing. So, obviously, it's been a really good news story. I suppose I want to thank the Minister.